for me, the biggest takeaway from that is things have changed just a little since I learned Fortran in 1980. <laughs> so, our next speaker is Dr. Carlotta Berry. Dr. Carlotta Berry hails from Nashville, Tennessee, and has been married to William Berry for 15 years. They have an 11 year old daughter, Kennedy Amaya. Carlotta received her PhD from Vanderbilt University in electrical engineering with a thesis on human robot interaction. She has a master's degree in control systems from Wayne State University and two bachelor's degrees, one in mathematics from Spelman College and another in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech. Before earning her PhD, Dr. Berry worked for several years as a manufacturing controls engineer for Ford Motor Company and also Detroit Edison. In her free time, Dr. Berry helps with her daughter Kennedy's Girl Scout troop and mentors her robotics team called the Gamer Girls. Dr. Berry's hobbies include cross-stitching, Sudoku, watching movies, and reality TV. Dr. Berry, congratulations on your promotion. Thank Professor. you. So I will say that my talk is just a tad bit different than the one you just heard. Uh, mine actually focuses a lot more on me, myself, and my journey. So the title is Hashtag I Look Like an Engineer. I look like an engineer is a play on words because one, we're the Rose Holman engineers, so I look like a Rose Holman engineer. And it's also a play on the fact that I'm actually an electrical engineer. So I want to talk about breaking the mold. So first, why the title? In 2015, Isis Winger was a software engineer at a company in the, um, Southern California, and her company asked her to participate in a media campaign to recruit more engineers. They took a picture of her where she described her job and they posted it in the Bay Area Rapid Transit System and then something very unexpectedly happened. People went on social media and said, why are you posting this fake picture of this woman on the train system trying to make us think she's an engineer? We know she's a model. We know she's an actor. There was social media um, complaints about why is she making that snarky face? Why is she dressed like that? Etc. because they couldn't believe she was actually an engineer. So she then went to social media with a sign that said, hashtag I look like an engineer, and she described her job. And that launched this viral campaign with women and men and minorities posting signs about hashtag I look like a scientist, I look like a doctor, I look like a professor, and it went on and on. The reason this resonated with me is because even today, when I'm traveling and when I'm going places, people express surprise when I tell them I'm an engineer and I'm a professor. I've been at the drugstore, I've been at the car shop, I've been on the airport, and I've been grading papers. And I've had people say, are you a college student? No, I'm a little old to be a college student. <laughs> are, you, are you a school teacher? Well, I teach. Well, what do you teach? I teach engineering. You teach engineering? You're a college professor? And they're still shocked. So I wanted to actually talk about that. And I, I told a couple of people who said they were excited about my talk, I said, no robots today. If you want to hear my robot talk, please come to my class. I'll talk to you about robots all day, but I felt that this is something that I could talk about that a lot of other people could not, and that this was more important than my robot talk. So when she started that campaign, I actually started giving presentations on this. So I have given iterations of pre presentations like this at high schools, at universities, at colleges, to young people everywhere, because I just think it's very important that we all work together to diversify the engineering profession. And that includes breaking the mold. So here's my, um, my slide for breaking the mold. Engineering has a marketing problem. Engineers are more than that nerdy guy with the pocket protector who can't look anyone in the eye or have a conversation with them. I think that if engineers are going to solve the problems of the day's world, they need to look like the face of the people that are in this world and the problems that they're going to solve. So I feel a big part of that is for me to work on diversifying the profession. So the reason the robotics is important to me is because it's multidisciplinary. So it can exhibit that intersectionality between all these different disciplines. And it also represents my intersectionality as a woman of color and as an engineer and as a faculty member. So by doing that, we all break the mold so the engineer actually looks more like this. This is actually what we want engineering to look like because engineers solve the world's problems. So in the upper right corner, you, that's actually Isis Winger, and that's actually the ad that was posted on the train system that started all of this. And then underneath there, that's her picture. There's a clicker somewhere in there. Um, underneath there, there is the um, first thing that she posted. Well, whatever. Um, <laughs> that's the first thing that she posted that started the hashtag, I look like an engineer campaign. So all these other pictures are ones that I actually found on social media somewhere of different people showing what engineers should look like. And Rose Holman actually also put one on Twitter. I talk about in my bio that I'm really into um, 
social media and things like that. So that's why all these pictures all came from Twitter because that's where I like to live sometimes when I need some time to, to relax and things like that. So the hashtag I look like an engineer campaign, Isis Winger talked about it challenged gender and racial stereotypes for certain professions in order to promote diversity. Because I think that's very important because diverse teams are better in improving communication, coming up with better solutions to problems, and also for people learning how to interact with others so that they can actually see different perspectives. One of the examples I give in my freshman design class here at Rose, um, I found this one online, is someone had developed a soap dispenser somewhere where it actually used your skin color to drop the soap in your hands, and they had only calibrated it for like a peach color skin. So this video is actually on YouTube where the people with brown color are putting their hand under the soap dispenser and the soap never comes out. And then they take a white paper towel and put it under it and the soap drops. So I, I show this to my students to talk about diversity and this is what diverse teams would be because then someone else would have tested the dispenser to know it didn't work. Right. So one of the first things I want to do is to acknowledge my family and friends. Um, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams, hopes, and prayers. So here's a picture of my family, or just some of my family members. I actually got this quote from social media as well. I'm really t um, promoting that today. Um, and it's important because when I was in school, all those many, many years that I was in school, these people didn't understand why I was in school. Some of them don't have high school diplomas. They don't understand why I had to do all of what I had to do, but they still supported me and prayed for me anyway. So over there on the very far um, picture is my grandmother, who I'm named after. She died before I was born. And she was a piano teacher for 30 years. Next to her is my aunt, who died when I was 12. I'm also named after her. And then right here in the middle in the blue is my mom. She's actually still alive, but she's in Tennessee. And she was a, a kindergarten teacher for 40 years. So as you can see, teaching is in my blood. So, and then I also want to acknowledge my husband and my daughter. They're not here today, but they also have been very supportive and have sacrificed a lot for somebody who is an extreme overachiever, such as myself and a workaholic, so I want to acknowledge them, as well as the rest of the people in my family. These are the people who prayed for me and supported me, so I have to acknowledge them first. The other people I want to acknowledge are my village. My village are <coughs> my friends who are like my family. So in that first picture in the upper, I can't remember, is it upper left for you guys? I guess it's upper left. Those are my closest friends. I have known them all for over 25 years. One of them I have known since I was 14 years old, and three of them are also engineers. And in the bottom left, here are more pictures of these same friends. These are the people who um, I talk to about the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> they are always a listening ear. In that middle picture, these are some of my Spelman sisters at our 25-year reunion. One of those was my freshman year roommate. She actually read my full professor portfolio. So these are people not just from college, but to this day who still support me through this entire journey. In that bottom middle, I call those the unhidden figures. They also went to Spelman College as well, but many, many years after I did. And we actually did a podcast on unhidden figures, as well as we've had workshops at the National Society of Black Engineers to encourage more students of color to go into the, the professoriate. Because it's not just a leaky pipeline when it comes to the students, but we've got to diversify the faculty and the staff as well. So over here on this other side, we're called the chalk docs. So the unhidden figures are also chalk docs. So the chalk docs is there is less than 200 black women faculty in engineering in the country. That number has been right around 200 or below for years, for decades actually. So we all support each other. And so ways that we support each other is we hold conferences, we hold workshops, um, we're listening ear to each other. So here, this top picture was actually this year at ASWE. We have an intergenerational mentoring program, which means that any woman of color in engineering who's a faculty member who joins this, she gets a mentor, you get a collaborator, you get sponsors, you get advocates. A lot of the things that the speaker this morning spoke about, if hopefully some of you were there to hear that. So this is how we support each other. And the reason I say this is important is because a lot of universities are really working hard to diversify the student population. However, the student population is transient. The faculty are permanent. So the jobs you're doing with the students have to also be done with the faculty as well. Because it's the faculty on campus, in particular women of color, who are dealing with microaggressions, the double bind, and all of these other things as well. And those are the people who are going to recruit those students to want to come and stay there. 
So if they're not getting the support they need, how are they going to keep that population of students to diversify as well? So here's pictures of me because I actually got this from Mario. I don't know. I don't remember what he did. His full professor talked. He showed all these pictures of like from Italy and things like that. I was like, well, I want to show the pictures of me when I was a baby because I was cute. So, <laughs> so, so, so here's some pictures of me from when I was little. And I talk about, I call this slide, wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. The only author I ever remember reading when I was younger was Maya Angelou. And um, she had a book of poems called Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now. And she got that from Eyes on the Prize, which was a film as well. And it was about um, being a woman and the power of spirituality. And this represents my life and the journey that I've been on. So one of the things I want to really talk about is the fact that I'm an engineer is a miracle in and of itself. Because that little girl didn't know anything about STEM, nothing about robotics, nothing about science, and neither did anyone in her family. All she knew was Barbies and her dream house. And that was her life. The only thing she wanted to do was play with her Barbies and have school for them and teach because her family knew teachers. They didn't know engineering. And I say this because I want to em emphasize how important it is to look at everyone as a potential engineer, not just the people that fit our framework or our mold for it. Like the little kids who you know are already playing with robots or science and toolkits and all that, but see it in any child that has the affinity for such. So keep your head up. These are my high school pictures. And the title of this comes from when I was in high school, imposter syndrome is real. I was actually at a magnet school. I was selected to go to magnet school when I was in the seventh grade. But even when I was in high school, my principal, when I would walk down the hall, would tell me to keep my head up. Because I would walk with my head down because I didn't feel that I deserved to be there. I didn't know why they had picked me, who decided they thought that I should be in a magnet school. So that's why I call this slide, keep your head up. And then inroads. So talking about STEM. At this point, I still don't know anything about STEM. I'm working at fast food restaurants. I worked at a newspaper. I'm working at daycare centers. Because I was going to be a high school math teacher. That's what I was going to do when I graduated from high school or college. And I was in a program called Inroads, which is a program for kids to get them into community and leadership development through internships. And I had a career counselor come to me and say, you're really good at math and science. What do you want to do? I'm going to be a high school math teacher. My mom's a teacher. My grandma's a teacher. I'm going to be a teacher. And that person said to me, that's the difference between you driving a Yugo and a Mercedes. That was a complete lie, I, I now know. But at the time, I was like, I, was like, I don't want to be broke. I'd rather be an engineer, which I thought was a train conductor. So at the time, there was no internet. So I went to the library, and I looked up, and I figured out what an engineer was. And I said, I'm going to go to Spelman and Georgia Tech. Just in case this engineering thing doesn't work out, I can still fall back on being a teacher. So I have a math degree from Spelman, because I didn't know if that engineering thing was going to work. Um, the thing about that I want to say is that it's key that you, like I said, look at everyone as a possible engineer. And you break out of your framework. Because if that person, when I was in high school, had not had that 30-minute conversation with me, I wouldn't be standing here today. Because no one ever said to me, you're really good at this stuff. Be an engineer, except for that one person with that crazy advice about the Yugo. But it at least was a conversation that got me to make a decision. So if you accept the expectation of others, especially the negative ones, then you will never change the outcome. This is a conversation I actually have with Daniel a lot. Um, my freshman year at Spelman, I failed my very first calculus class. I got a D on the first exam and then got an F. I had my professor write a note and say, you need to come see me. I had came from a magnet school. I had taken trig in some calc in high school. I couldn't balance my social life with my academic schedule. They were actually interrupting each other. Then when I got to Georgia Tech, I failed two classes. I failed EMAG and digital logic. I teach classes like that now, but then I couldn't do it. So what this quote means to me is, when I was failing out, I had also run out of financial aid money, and they had sent me to the office to talk to someone about getting more money. His office was at the top of two landing of steps. When I got to the top, he wouldn't let me in his office. He said, tell me your GPA, and I want you to step down one step for every point that's below a four. At the time, I had a two five. When I finished talking, I was at the bottom of the bottom landing of the steps. He said, you know what? You're here with a bad game plan. I want you to go home. You don't deserve to be an engineer. You don't deserve to be here. Your grades are deplorable. I'm standing here crying. This is the person they told me to go see to give me money to keep me in school. I was one quarter from graduating. And he just stood there and said, you got a bad game plan, baby. You need to go home. Your grades are terrible. And I just stood there. This was at Georgia Tech. And when I didn't leave, this man walks in his office, picks a phone up, calls somebody, and within two minutes got me enough money to graduate. 
And I don't remember that man's face. I don't remember that man's title. But I will never forget how that man made me feel. And that's the reason I'm here today. Because I said at that moment, I'm going to become a college professor in engineering so that I can change the face of this profession. So people would know that was not acceptable and it was not appropriate. When I graduated, I sent that man an invitation to my college graduation. So. But that, what I was saying about Daniel is this is a conversation I have with him all the time about. Sometimes it's like, God, why are students always in your office? And why are you talking to the ones who can't pass anything? That was me. And it wasn't I wasn't smart. It was that I was broke. I worked three jobs the whole time I was in college. I'm tutoring people. I'm, I'm working fast food. I'm doing all these other things. I couldn't pass my classes and pay my bills. But if someone had seen me as just that, they would have never seen me as an engineer. I like to say that the two schools I went to, Spelman and Georgia Tech, were both Rose Holman. Spelman gave me that family environment, that encouragement, that love and all of that, and I model that here. Georgia Tech had the rigor of, of Rose Holman with none of the love. And I know there's a lot of Georgia, <laughs> there's a lot of Georgia Tech alumni in the room. I know, shout out to you. But I always say Georgia Tech treated their grad students like children and treated the undergrads like Cinderella. I don't know, it just wasn't the same. And so I just think all of that is the reason that I decided, decided to become a professor. But I was broke, like I said, when I graduated from undergrad, so I had to go work. So my first job was at Fort Motor Company. I worked the third shift, I worked in the middle of the night, and I went to grad school during the day. So I slept in class a lot. And there came a point where I had to say, I have to make a decision. So I actually left Ford um, to go to graduate school full time, and everyone in my family told me I was blazing crazy. We're talking about people where I'm making more money now than they've ever made in their life. And I quit my job to go and become a grad student. So I like to say this picture and that Kool-Aid smile you see is not just because I got my PhD after six years, but it was because that represents all the twists and turns through the fell in the classes in undergrad, through the crazy guy at Georgia Tech, through the working through the middle of the night and going to school during the day. And that's why you can only become truly accomplished at something you love, but don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things you love doing and do them so well that people can't take their eyes off you. All the other tangible rewards will come as a result. So it's kind of like all my family who told me I was crazy, they were all there that day when I graduated. So I like to say, make your purpose your passion. These are pictures of me from my first university. I actually worked somewhere else before I came to Rose Holman. And faith is taking that first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. I was only there for three years. I'm an overachiever. So when I knew I had to leave because something wasn't right, I really felt like a failure. And I, things that encouraged me the most, I want to give a shout out to Fred Berry. Because the three years I was at that school, I had already turned the job down at Rose once. Fred was sending me postcards every year. I don't know if people in my department knew that. Fred was mailing stuff to me, to my department head. My department head would go to conferences and say, Fred Berry asked about you again. Um, <laughs> David Bowmer came to Vanderbilt to recruit me. Every year at ASWE, David Bowmer would walk up to me and go, you ready to leave yet? You coming to Rose yet? You ready to leave yet? So what I want to say is, looking at those people you think you can't get, you keep working on them. Because they worked on me for three years to change my mind to come here. And so I wanted to also acknowledge some of the impact programs that I've done that I feel have affected me in the community. I wrote an article, they call me Dr. Berry, in the New York Times. And I got reached out from people all over the world from emails and letters about that. One of the prouder ones was Smith College. Those young women went to their department and said, we, give us some money. We want to fly her here to talk to us. So that's what that picture is up in the corner. This one is when I went back to my high school, the high school where they told me to hold my head up when I was there as a student. I came back and spoke to them as well. And then I got an award, or two awards, the Crossroads Regional, which was the first robotics competition we used to have here on campus. So that was an award that I was really proud of, because that's a program that I really think Rose needs to actually reinvest in, because that's our population that comes to events like that. And I got a Women in High Tech Leading Light Award for a program that I started with Deborah Walter, which is the Rosebud program, which is still existing on campus. It is my hope someday to actually make that an institute-wide program because it's a program to encourage women and minorities to pursue, to pursue degrees in engineering and science. And I want to acknowledge the robotics minor, which I started with David Fisher and Matt Baltel, and there's other people involved like David Mutchler as well, this writer as well. And the March for Science. Rose Holman students actually reached out to me, and that was at the Indiana State House, and I got to go speak to thousands of people in front of the Indiana State House about diversity in science. So 
I have one last slide. I like to say, to whom much is given, much is required. And I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how they, you make them feel. So on my full professor bucket list, uh, first I have to acknowledge the Gamer Girls. That's my team, that's what I do with all my extra time. It's my daughter's first Lego League and Vex Robotics team. And they're also Girl Scouts as well. Um, so I think there should be something also called the Gamma Girls. There needs to be more outreach for younger girls on this campus. They don't have to be on campus, but we have to start diversifying at a younger age. These girls are all fourth through about fifth and sixth grade. We have to start at that age. And I want to acknowledge the work that David Mutchler and David Fisher are already doing in that realm as well. I think we've got to start doing something for the students who we are recruiting and bringing here who are not ready. And I think there needs to be a Rose Bridge program. We have Catapult, we have Ramp, we have Fast Track, we have Project Select. We don't have anything for these students from under-resourced high schools who are coming here and cannot pass calculus and physics. They are here and they are floundering. I think Rose Bridge, needs, if we're going to admit them, we need to do something for them. It doesn't have to be taught by faculty, it can be taught by high school teachers. But that four weeks before school starts, they need to have some, somebody mentoring them and talking to them about algebra skills, programming skills, study skills, physics. They need to be in a cohort. They need to have mandatory tutoring study sessions because what's happening is they're coming to our offices, or at least my office, like, I'm failing and I'm lost. What do I do? They're here now. If we're going to recruit them, we have to give them resources to be successful or don't recruit them. Um, my sabbatical, I'm going to skip that because my time is up. I'll tell you about that later if you want to hear about it. But I want to actually enhance the robotics curriculum on campus. We have students who are picking Rose Holman because we have a robotics minor. We need more courses in the curriculum and we need more research opportunities for them. So one thing I am pitching for, and I have no money by the way, these are just ideas. There needs to be, there needs to be a multidisciplinary educational robotics lab on this campus. There's so many people doing robotics work. My robotics lab is the corner of my office where my, my robots are shoved. There needs to be a place where we all bring this stuff together and we collaborate, all these people in all these departments and all these students on these projects. I'm done. Thank you for listening and thank you for your support. Dr. Chu received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering.